Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India A very warm welcome to all of you in this course called Development Processes and Social Movements and here we are for the lecture number 14 and this uh, lecture is titled as Old and New Social Movements in Indian Context. So, uh, so far you have read about the various processes regarding development and the previous lecture that you had was about development processes and social movements. So, in that you have been told how these two are interlinked how development affects a country and why do social movements occur and what are the different types of social movements. This particular lecture will tell you about old and new social movements and in a way I would first like to tell you that uh, these, this conception of old and new is first of all as you can see that it is about the timeline. So, old is something that used to take place in a previous time and now the new social movements. So, it will have one it has a global context as well as it has an Indian context. So, in the in this lecture we will keep oscillating between the two I will first tell you about a few things uh, which is about the global uh, you can say scenario uh, the different theories regarding social movements and then I will tell you about the Indian context. So, we will take up some concrete examples of different kinds of social movements. So, let me first tell you about social movements and then we will go on to the old and new. So, before we say old and new let us see what is social movement. So, as such there is no precise definition. So, there is no universal definition as such that what is social movement, but rather there are numerous interpretations of social movements because in different contexts social movements have been defined in different ways. And there are various terms which are used for uh, social movements. For example, sometimes they are also called the protests, then revolution, rebellion. So, all these are different uh, like sometimes they are confused with social movements, but that is the contribution of this lecture that we will now learn about why social movement is different from protests or revolution or rebellion. So, uh, as you can understand that social movements as a topic is something which is studied in not just uh, like first of all it is most important in sociology as a discipline, but at the same time we study about it in political science as well. Even in history we study about uh, social movements. So, different kinds of social movements are studied in different disciplines of social sciences. Thus, I say that it has an interdisciplinary orientation means we study about it in different disciplines. So, there are there can be different kind of orientation and it is used more in political sociology as a sub discipline. So, there is a scholar called M. S. A. Rao who has defined it as it these are sustained collective mobilization through formal or informal organization generally oriented towards bringing about social change. So, this is the point like there are two points coming up from this definition which you should keep in mind. One that it is a collective social mobilization. So, mobilizing the mass is something which takes place in social movement and secondly it has it aims at some kind of social change. So, social movement will always lead to some or the other kind of social change. Now, other than M. S. A. Rao, it is Ghansham Shah who had studied uh, quite a lot of uh, social movements. So, he uses the definition given by Paul Wilkinson. So, Paul Wilkinson is considered as one of the first scholars who started the study of social movements. So, he says that social movements are deliberative collective action to promote change in any direction and by any means. So, he uses four terms, Ghansham Shah uses four terms revolt, rebellion and re reform and revolution. But if you will look at these four terms, let me quickly just underline these four revolt, 
rebellion, reform and revolution. So, sometimes we tend to confuse these categories, but for example, we call 1857 in India what we call the Sepoy mutiny that is considered as one of the revolts. Then there are some movements which we call a rebellion, so peasants. So, there is this outbreak of some kind of you can say momentous kind of a change. So, such things we call rebellion. Then reform, reform is quite gradual that slow and steady kind of for example, the works done by Raja Ram Mohan Roy or the works done by Jyotiba Phule etc. So, they were the ones who uh, led to social reforms. Then revolution, revolution is the term which is used more of in the Marxist context and revolution has this notion of use of violence. So, that is why I have mentioned that it depends on the nature of objectives and secondly intensity of the movement. So, these are the two things you should remember that depending on the nature of objectives and the intensity of the movements that they vary in uh, in terms of their spread. So, that is why sometimes they can be called revolt, sometimes uh, reform to revolution different names are used. So, now next I am going to talk about components of social movements. So, what are the things that we need? in order to have a social movement. So, we need to have a collective mass mobilization. So, there should be a mass which is to be mobilized. Second, there has to be collective mass support. A social movement cannot take place without the mass support. So, you have to have the support from the mass. Similarly, you have to have a formal or informal organization because in order to sustain a movement for a longer duration of time, you need to have an organization and you must have heard of numerous organizations. For example, uh, Brahma Samaj was established uh, uh, for social reforms or Arya Samaj was established by Dayanand Saraswati, Raja Ram Mohan Roy has established, had established Brahma Samaj. Then uh, Jyotiba Phule, he established Satya Shodhak Samaj. So, all these uh, organizations which were set up for say things like uh, empowering the women to uh, spreading mass education. So, if you have a cause, then you have to have an organization in order to get, get those works done. Then the next is that a conscious commitment toward it, towards its aim and belief. So, whichever the social movement, it should have certain aims and beliefs, then only it can keep moving on. So, it has to keep reminding itself about its aim. Next is the deliberative collective action towards change. So, whatever the change you have decided for, you have to gradually keep moving towards that change and that has to be deliberate. Means, people should be convinced about it that we have to carry forward this change. Then you need leadership. So, any social movement to become successful, it has to have a certain leadership because uh, sometimes without leadership, the social movement may go wayward. I mean, it will have no direction. But here I would also like to tell you that sometimes there is a change in leadership. Uh, for example, if the first leader dies and a new uh, leader comes up, uh, takes forward the movement, then it is likely that the movement will have a new direction that can be one. Secondly, there can be a split in the movement that the movement may uh, get into two parts and here I would like to give you the example of Anna movement. Uh, Anna movement was first uh, led by Anna Hazare, but later on you get to see that Arvind Kejriwal uh, took another direction. He decided to have a political party. So, what happens is that sometimes a social movement may start as with having a certain kind of uh, its objective, but eventually its objective may get changed. So, in all those things, uh, the leadership plays an important role. So, these were the six components that I have mentioned to you and if you would like to remember, then you should remember three to four points. One is about the mass that you have to have mass support, then you should have organization, it can be either formal or informal. Then third is that it must have some aim and belief and fourth it should have leadership. So, you should remember these four points regarding the components of social movements. Now, we move on to theories of social movements. So, here this part I have based on the theories that we have from the western uh, scholars. For example, how did this started? How did this start the study of social movements? So, first thing was theory of relative deprivation. 
So, here it was argued that since some groups feel deprived, they feel that they are not getting their due and that is why that social group starts some kind of protest. So, the social conflict arises when a social group feels that it is worse off than others around it. So, relative deprivation that is the first kind of a theory and in such case the conflict is likely to result in collective protest. For example, let me give you an example uh, if in India Hindus are in majority and say Muslims or Christians they are in minority. So, the minority community may go for protest saying this that uh, the Hindus are advantaged much more vis-a-vis -vis us the Christians or Muslims. So, relative deprivation here in the case of the example that I gave that is due to their number. Sometimes it can also be for a certain language suppose a certain community speaks a certain language and, and the other ones of which the speakers are lesser in number they may feel deprived. Then uh, the second is that is by Mankur Olson he wrote a book titled The Logic of Collective Action. So, from relative deprivation that if people feel deprived to now it is collective action. So, what is the logic of collective action? He says that the social movement is an aggregation of rational individual actors. So, Mankar also argues that it is only the rational people who tend to pursue. So, why will they go for social movement? That will be for the safeguard of their self interest. So, if they want to pursue their self interest what they will do is a person will join a social movement only if he or she will gain something from it. So, Mankur also was of the view that the human beings are the rational beings and they keep seeing their own self interest and the motive behind being part of any social movement is that if they see that they are going to have some kind of gain from that. So, he or she will participate only if the risks are less than the gains. So, we human beings tend to evaluate whether the gains are more or the loss. So, we will participate in social movement only if we speculate that the gains are more. So, Olson's theory is based on the notion of the rational utility maximizing individual. So, Mankar Olson is actually theorizing his uh, notion of social movement on the basis of human beings being the rational beings one and then we tend to maximize our utility. We tend to think that we are going to gain more from these social movements. The third theory came from McCarthy and Zald. These two thinkers they talked about resource mobilization. So, they rejected what Olson was saying that the social movements are based on uh, such a notion that individuals want to have their they want to pursue their self interest. So, rather McCarthy and Zell they say that social movement success actually depend on its ability to mobilize the resources. So, people are interested in mobilizing their resources and all the different communities want to have more resources. So, it is actually about having more resources. So, how to mobilize the resources in such a way that a certain group which is seeking for more resources should will have a kind of benefit. So, this uh, these three theories are the major uh, theories of social movements and they tell us why and how the study of social movements started worldwide. And now social movements itself is an area of study. And as I told you that it is an interdisciplinary area of study. We study about social movements in uh, sociology to political science to history. Different disciplines study social movements as per their orientation. Now, we come to the different types of social movements. So, first we studied about the theories as in why do social movements occur and now we move on to the types. What are the typology? So, here I have partly talked about and it is one of the major theories that there are three types of social movements. One is the redemptive or transformatory, second is the reformist and third is revolutionary. So, let us first begin with the redemptive 
or transformatory social movements. So in redemptive social movements, they aim at bringing a change due to a personal consciousness or actions of individual members. For example, here I have given the example of Narayan Guru who was a social reformer in Kerala and he worked for the betterment of Izhava community. So what happened is that he worked for the caste reforms in Kerala but you can also take the example of some other people who were like uh, for their own uh, personal consciousness because what they felt that something is bad in the society and they want to bring change. So such change which is the transformatory change. So the change within one person may actually lead to a better change in the entire uh, society. For example, uh, even Aurobindo's example you may take. Aurobindo established his organization called Auroville in, uh, in Pondicherry and uh, now it is considered as a, a place where people come from uh, all over the world in order to they seek for inner peace or uh, different techniques of meditation. So th these are the redemptive social movements or transformatory social movement. Then the second type of social movements are the reformist social movements. So they strive to change the existing social or political arrangements through gradual or incremental steps means they aim at bringing change gradually slow and steady step by step. For example, uh, the 1960s movement for the reorganization of Indian states and this reorganization of Indian states took place on the basis of language and uh, recently there was this right to information which we call RTI. So how did RTI uh, took place in India or how did we achieve RTI was that something the campaigns and protests were going on for a long time. So these are the examples of reformist movements it means slow and steady we aim at bringing some kind of social change. But for that you also need the change in constitution or some acts are to be passed in order to bring those changes. The third movement that I have mentioned is that revolutionary. So first was redemptive, second was reformist. Now we are moving to uh, revolutionary. So in revolutionary social movements what happens is that we want to like such movements want to capture the state power. So in that sense revolutionary social movements are very different from that of those two previous ones and in revolutionary social movements most of the times there is use of violence as well. So they look for radical change they want the you can say transformative kind of a change the sudden change means the change in power structure. So for example as Bolshevik revolution took place in Russia you must be knowing the year 1917 and ever since Russia had Bolshevik revolution even in China you get to see that China also gradually led to communist regime. So it is in a Marxist framework that uh, we tend to use the term revolution. Even the Naxalite movement in India somehow adopted some strategy and, and they call themselves Maoists. So inspired by Maoism the Naxal movements because they also used arms and they want to seize the state power and that's why Naxalite movements are in a way um, they are also example of revolutionary movements. So the major point that you should remember or you should keep in mind that in the previous two that is redemptive and reformist movement there is no use of violence but in revolutionary uh, social movements there is a use of violent means. Now I next discuss the subaltern perspective. Maybe some of you must have heard of subaltern perspective. It, this is a new way of interpreting uh, the history that came up in 1980s and it aims at uh, rewriting the history, writing the history from below. So the idea of subaltern school is that they say that so far the way the history has been written it is in favor of the dominant groups of the society and here they give the example of the congress that if you look at the example of indian national congress then that was dominated by the 
upper caste and uh, and class of the indian society and it could not accommodate the interests of people like say the tribals or uh, the villagers so the rural population they did not get their due attention they were not given their due recognition so th this is uh, due to the need to write the history again that subaltern perspective is actually a group of some scholars for example shahid amin to ramchandra guha these are the people or even ranjit guha these are the people who stress on understanding that the collective action is something that we need to study and they say that we should not just study the grand narratives of what we call the nationalist movement but there were actually numerous small movements which were going on all over the country so we need to document such experiences of resistance so subaltern perspective stresses a great deal on resistance in order to study the domination that there were different kinds of domination so it was not just that the britishers were ruling india and that was domination of one kind but there was also something that the zamindars were dominating over the landless then there was something that the males were dominating over the females so there were numerous kinds of dominances prevalent in the society at the same time so this perspective enables us to appreciate the contradictions that are intrinsic part of subaltern consciousness so the subalterns argue that it is not just one grand narrative that's one kind of movement but there are dichotomies there are numerous things within for example within congress when there was this debate about leadership or for example what kind of a country india will be once it gains uh, once it gains independence whether we will be a democratic country or some other version of of other version of its type of governance so the numerous debates which keep going on in a country at some point it's something that we need to take care of so other than shahid amin and ramchandra guha even david hardiman has studied and he has used the subaltern approach to study the religious beliefs here i have missed a g there should be among the tribals in western india so what he tried to do is that he studied the religious beliefs of the tribal population in western india so hardiman argues that the way the tribals perform their religious rites it is not similar to that of hindus and we should recognize the, that there is a prevalence of or there is an existence of different ways of religious worships within india so this point you should remember that this notion of writing the history from below or rewriting the history by those at the social margins means those who were marginalized for a long time they should also get a chance to write their history now the next point that i have mentioned is tk umen tk umen is another he is a sociologist who has used the term protest and here i have i have in a way posed it vis-a-vis -vis james scott's idea of resistance about which i will tell you in another slide that james scott is a scholar from usa who has talked about the everyday resistances he says that the the society faces different kinds of resistance and there is this everydayness of resistance so tk omen suggests that instead of using the term resistance let us use the word protest so in that sense protest and resistance they are two terms and sometimes they are uh, even used interchangeably but these scholars have used these two terms in two different contexts and why does tk omen prefer a protest for indian context he says that protest is about organized violence uh, organized violent collective action so some kind of collective action which is pretty organized so they are not something that is unorganized but rather people have a kind of notion that they will do they will use some kind of violent means so use of violence can be there second there can be a non violent collective action third it can be organized violent or 
non violent and the term micro mobilization so what do i mean by micro mobilization for example at the level of community or say even a colony it can be a small scale kind of uh, uh, mobilization. So, actually it is about the scale of mobilization. For example, if I tell you about the use by Gandhi, how did Gandhi lead a mass mobilization? He tried to mobilize the masses, but sometimes there can be a micro mobilization means a small group of people can also be mobilized. Then there can be an unorganized one of as well means some kind of movement started, some people told the other people, they also became part of it. So, it is not that something which is always organized, but rather the, it can be unorganized as well. Then the last one he mentions are the individual protests. So, sometimes just one person being a victim of something, there can be an individual protest also in order to get his demands fulfilled. So, these are the different kinds of protests that TK Omen has mention. Now I come to social movements old and new because so far I told you about social movements and then I told you about theories of social movements different theories. Then we also talked about protest and previous to protest we talked about the subaltern perspective. So I am assuming that by now you have a backdrop of social movements. So, now when we study about what are old and new social movements, you are knowing what the social movements are. So, let me quickly recall a few points that one, it is about the collective action, social movement will always be a collective action. Second, social movements will always uh, look for some kind of social change. So, that is there, it will have some or the other objective it needs to have a leadership, then uh, it will also aim at uh, bringing a kind of social change. So, let me first tell you what are old social movements. Old social movements clearly saw reorganization of power relations as a central goal. So, they were looking at some kind of uh, reorganization. So, whatever was prevalent in the society, they were aiming at bringing a new kind of change. So, in that sense, the old social movements functioned within the frame of political parties. So, ideological orientation was very, very important in the old social movements. For example, the role played by Indian National Congress, which led the Indian National Movement. Similarly, the Communist Party of China led the Chinese Revolution. And today, some believe that old class based political action led by the trade unions, and workers parties is on the decline. So, what has happened is that the old social movements which were mostly ideology based, it is now declining gradually. Now, if we talk about the West like others have argued that in the affluent West with, the, with its welfare state, issues of class based exploitation and inequality were no, long, no longer the central concern. So, what happened is that once the countries gained their independence, once they were independent countries, so no more there, any, there was any discussion about class based uh, exploitation. So, who was exploiting whom? If there is democracy in that sense, then everyone is free, everyone is equal everyone has right to vote, then how will you argue that someone is um, exploiting anybody else? So, now the, there was a shift and this shift was towards new social movements which says that it is not about changing the distribution of power in the society, but rather it is about quality of life. So, there is a shift from class based or you can say ideology based to now it is about quality of life issues. For example, if you are looking for clean environment, then whether you are a liberal or Marxist or a feminist, your demand for clean environment is going to be the same. So, in that sense that ideological divide was no more of any use. So, while in the old social movements, the role of political parties was central. Now, in the new social movements, different groups of society came together 
to demand for such things. So to have told you the crude point about the old and new social movement from class to issue based or quality of life issues. Now we move on to the Indian scenario. How do we look at old social movements and new social movements in the Indian context? So again continuing from the previous point that in the old social movements even in India it was the role of political parties which was central and we have the example of Indian National Congress which not only played an important role in Indian national movement but also after three decades of independence like we became independent in 1947 and till 1977 that is for three decades India was ruled by Congress as a party. So that means for three decades Congress had an important role to play. So a political scientist like Rajni Kothari, they say that it was the, the social movements in India started in the 1970s when people had dissatisfaction with the way our parliamentary democracy was functioning. So what happened is that if a country like India gained independence, India became a democratic country, but then when and where was the problem? Why do social movements occur? means people had this dissatisfaction regarding the Congress as a political party. They were no more happy, they felt that there should be something more. So Kothari argues that institutions of the state had been captured by the elites. So there was just one section of the society which was you can say the richer section of the society. The elites can be of different kinds even the business class or say people like Tatas and Ambani's uh, because they had control upon the capital of the nation. So some people may have economic power similarly the political leaders had the political power. So what happened is that the power got concentrated in the hands of the elite. Due to this the electoral representation by political parties was no more effective and the poor were not getting their due. So there was a kind of unrest among the poor and they wanted to get their voice heard. And maybe you would have heard about JP movement which we also called that total revolution or Sampurn Kranti. So JP was the person who led the JP movement. It started from Bihar but eventually it spread into other parts of India with similar demands. They wanted the Congress to end its rule and you know that even the emergency Indira Gandhi government had imposed emergency because it was a revolution kind of situation. It was possible that the way JP movement was leading, it was likely to outthrow the government at that time. So people left the formal political system and the JP movement called for. Uh, there, was, there were two major demands. One that the corruption was at an all time high at that time and second there was this price rise which we also call inflation. So corruption and inflation were these two major issues in the JP movement. Next is the role of NGOs that the non-governmental organizations play an important role in the new social movements. So what happens is that they tend to bring the women's groups, environmental groups and tribal groups, all these groups they often come together in order to look for the change in the quality of life. So while in the old social movement it was ideology based and thus the political parties were important, in the new social movements it is the civil society which is important or the role of NGOs which is important and different groups sometimes if there is an environmental movement then there also the women will uh, join or sometimes even the tribals will join. So what happens is that it becomes a post ideological kind of demand that ideology is no more important but the issues are important. So what is playing a crucial another important factor is that of globalization. Uh, many of you would have heard of globalization we say that the whole world has become a global village. We are so connected with each other and technology has played, uh, played an important role in that. So people's lives are being reshaped and in that from industry to agriculture, even culture, all these are being 
shaped and reshaped and sometimes what happens is that the nature of such change is transnational means from one country to another country there is an impact and the organizations like WTO the World Trade Organization or even say IMF International Monetary Fund these international organizations are also very important. So things like environmental and health risks, the fear of nuclear warfare, uh, these are the global problems that we are facing and uh, no wonder that these new social movements are often joined um, internationally like the people from civil society from all over the world they join for some or the other cause. For example, recently we have seen uh, that in order to minimize the use of nuclear weapons, whether the whole world should have no nuclear weapon, can we make the world more prone to peace or whether we should have more and more of warfare. So it is about th making those choices, uh, you can say war versus peace. Coming to the recent developments, so what are the recent developments in this field of social movement? Gail Omvid in her book Reinventing Revolution and it Reinvent Revolution this book has a subtitle which is New Social Movement and the Socialist Tradition in India. So this book points out that the concerns regarding social inequality it says that India is prospering, India has a good economic development but at the same time we have not been uh, able to address the issue of social inequality. So this book says that due to unequal distribution of resources, uh, a certain section of the society which is still disadvantaged, they tend to move towards movements and they demand to the state that uh, their demand should also be fulfilled. For example, there are peasant movements they have mobilized for better prices for their pro produce and they have protested against the removal of agricultural subsidies. So the farmers have this kind of dissatisfaction, the policies which are made are not in favor of farmers. Similarly, there are Dalit laborers who are demanding that they often go become a collective and they say that the upper caste landowners and money lenders, they often discriminate them or they give them the money, they lend them the money at a higher interest rate. So it is the Dalits or especially those who are poor, they feel disadvantaged. Similarly, there are women's movement, there the issue of gender discrimination is there that the women tend to feel discriminated be it at the workplace or even in the families, uh, their decision making. So at diverse spheres, be it workplace or the family, that they feel discriminated. So here I have given you three examples, one that of the farmers, the peasants, Dalits and the women. And all these are especially the women's or even Dalits, it's the new social movements. In peasant, we can now have the old and new both because when it will have an ideological orientation of a certain kind then it will be then it will fall in old social movement but if we will talk about the recent ones and when i will teach you uh, a lecture on uh, farmers movement there i will tell you how there is this shift from old social movement to new social movement so there is a possibility that over a span of time there can be a change and uh, for example if we talk about farmers movement or Dalit movement then they may move from a kind of from old to new. Now I have talked about because the same point that we are mentioning why and how there is this blurring boundaries this becomes fuzzy the boundary between old and new because in recent times many social movements which we see in India it is difficult to demarcate between old and new. So why am I saying this? Because the new social movements are not just about old issues of economic inequality nor are they organized along class lines, identity politics, cultural anxieties. So you have to remember these points, uh, the, there are identity politics, then cultural anxieties 
and aspirations these are the three elements which have become essential elements while earlier it was mostly the ideology and economic inequality now these three have also become added so people are restless about their identity there is a kind of cultural anxiety and people have aspirations all the different groups are seeking for more for themselves so it has led to new kinds of social movements where it is difficult to trace their class based inequality so what happens is that within a movement there can be participation by different groups and thus new social movements tend to unite the participants and that class boundary also gets blurred for example the women's movement includes urban middle class feminists as well as the poor peasant women so when we call this if women's movement is one bigger category it has urban uh, women also the poor peasant women will be called the rural women also then the middle class feminist in middle class feminist they can be working and non working women so the point that i want to make is that within women's movement you get to see different groups of women so if you have to place women's movement in old or new where will you place it so you have no choice but to put it in the new social movement because now there is this diversity of issues uh, then there is the change in ideologies and there are different sections with different demands they are coming up together similarly the second example that i have given you is the regional movements for separate statehood so what has happened in that that there also they the people who are coming into such movements they have different orientation they may have different orientation ideologically marxist or gandhian but their demand for separate statehood for that they may come together so what the demand is will decide that who all will come together for that demand so that's how the point that i want to make is that new social movements tend to unite the different sections of the society so in a social movement questions of social inequality can occur alongside other so what happens is that other than social inequality the issues like ideological leanings as well as the leadership these are the points that we need to keep in mind now here what i have done is that i said i thought that let us revisit the chipko movement in uttarakhand so chipko movement is one of the most famous movements so shekhar pathak has recently studied chipko movement at its 40 years and he says that there is a criss cross of issues there are ecological issues and there are material concerns so how will you place chipko movement is it an old social movement or a new social movement and if we say that it is an ecological movement or it is an environmental movement so we place the environmental movements into the new social movements but at the same time if you see that it has material concerns as in who should have control upon the forests whether the state should control the forest or it should be the local people so there uh, you will see that people have divided opinions and thus we call it the green versus red debate so red uh, is the concern we say that the left parties have this symbol of red color and green is the symbol of the ecological so it is said that uh, in the chipko we see the shades of green and red both so there are ideological divides which are reflected in the leadership as well as for the role of the women so while sundarlal bahuguna he had a gandhian orientation and uh, he he talked about the pristine uh, beauty of nature that the hills should not be disturbed on the other hand for chandi prasad bhat another leader of chipko he was concerned about the issue of livelihood the people who are living in the hills so if they are dependent on the hills produce then how are we going to ensure their livelihood so these two issues whether we go for the beauty of the hills or we are also concerned about the livelihood 
So I am sure you will understand that both are important and we cannot say either this or that but both have importance or significance of their own. So uh, Ramchandra Guha has underlined the presence of different ideological strands within Chipko. He says that there is a strand of Gandhian uh, kind, then there is this Marxian and there is also feminist. So these are the three strands which Ramchandra Guha has said. So I have tried to show you these two scholars approach, Shekhar Pathak's approach and uh, Ramchandra Guha's approach to show you the presence of the elements of old as well as new social movements within Chipko movement. Now the second example that I have given you is of Koila Satyagra. Koila Satyagra has recently taken place in Raigarh and there it is again a classic case of blurring boundaries between old and new because there the villagers united themselves to oppose the mining to oppose the coal mining. They said that no coal mining should take place by a company and they rather demanded for mining rights for themselves. So similar to Namak Satyagraha which was led by Gandhi, these villagers are asking for uh, Koila Satyagraha that they should be given the rights to have like they can conduct mining on their own. So they, what they did is that they have pooled in their land and they have registered a company, Gare Tap Upkram Company. So this is a company by the people. So 700 acres of land from 56 villages, they have pooled in this land in order to save the land from being taken by a company or by for being taken by the state. So they don't want the state or the company to do mining, they want to do it themselves. So here in Koila Satyagraha, you see there are different issues. There is this issue of environmental degradation to people's rights over their land. So one issue is of environmental degradation because when the mining takes place, then it leads to environmental degradation. Second is the people's rights over their land and mineral. So these two issues are interlinked, the issue of environment as well as the issue of people's livelihood. Third example I have given you is that of Niyamgiri struggle in Odisha. So it was in the year 2003 that the Odisha government gave this land, not the land but this mountain, Niyamgiri mountain to the Vedanta company for mining. But there the Dongaria Kondh community which has been living in the Niyamgiri hills for a very long time, they say that this, these hills are actually our god. And they say that we call it Niyam Raja. Niyam means we call it rules. So they say that for us this mountain is a god but for the state and for the company they look at it as just something uh, in order to take away our minerals. So this led to a kind of legal battle uh, between two communities and the decision was in favor of Dongaria Kondh community. So that became a landmark. And it is, I consider it a landmark case for nature's rights. So the rights of the mountains, rights of the rivers, etc. So these are the new developments in the field of new social movements. Now here I have summarized some of the points, the recent developments in the field means in the study of social movements. So first point that I have mentioned is uh, that if that is of the art of resistance in everyday life which is a study by James Scott. So I had mentioned about James Scott when I was telling you about use of the term protest by TK women, but James Scott uses the word resistance. He says that this form of everyday life, everyday some form of small struggles taking place, it is less than revolutionary. So while revolutionary thing has a use of violence, but in this resistance in everyday life, it is most likely going to be non-violent. Second is the same scholar James Scott, he wrote a book called Weapons of the Weak and he tried to understand the class relations in a peasant society. So Scott argues that we get to see there is a contradiction in terms of the behavior by the poorer sections. So they tend to use two different languages 
the way they talk to each other means within their community they have their strategy they plan their things differently but when they are talking to the elite section of the society then they look at them as and there is this use of term say the my bap sarkar be it the government officials or uh, the money lenders so the poor have this another notion for themselves but for for those who are superior to them they tend to bow down in front of them so these are the things how james scott tried to study the small scale kind of resistances that the resistance is something which is part of everyday life so what has happened is that of late now resistance has itself become a conceptual category in social sciences so as we had social movements as we had protest now we also have resistance as one category to study in social movements so uh, and another thing that has played an important role is that the rise of subaltern studies in terms of rewriting the history we tend to study resistance in a major way in subaltern studies now in a recent literature by uday sahai he has written about new forms of protest and he mentions three ways one is the rightful resistance for example what i gave you the example of uh, chatisgarh koila satyagraha so there the people are demanding for rights for themselves then there is law fair means you question the given law and you fight the case in the court as i gave you the example of niamgiri struggle that uh, the tribal population they decided to go for a court case so in in case of lawfare social movement is no more just a protest or dharna but you rather fight that case in court and third is that of political society political society is a term used by partha chatterjee he says that as we have civil society we also have a political society means people who have right to vote they try to see that whether state is treating them adequately or not so in terms of political society people have their willful demands they ask they keep negotiating with the state for their demands so what unites these three forms is that all three of them they do not aim at regime change so these are not revolutions because in revolution they want to seize the power in their hand they want to outthrow the state but when we talk about protests and resistance then they want the change within means they look for some or the other kind of tweaking with the given rules and regulations so that people are advantaged by the policies that the state is making so in that sense these uh, protests do not have any revolutionary consequences but rather they just want some kind of minor change in the society so these were the recent developments how we have moved from old social movements to new social movements and now we have the resistance and protest as two new categories and they tell us about the everyday forms of resistance means there are new ways of looking for a change in the society which should be gradual now we move on to the last uh, slide of our uh, chapter which i have titled as conclusion before we go on to conclude the lecture let me quickly have a recap in order to understand what all did we do in this chapter so to begin with we let me quickly just go to the first slide i'll just quickly recap we did the introduction in which i gave you the definition of like there are numerous not that there is a universal one but they are rather different ways of interpreting social movements then we discuss the components of social movements about mass mobilization and role of organization to leadership etc then we discussed about theories of social movement where i primarily told you about three one was relative deprivation then collective action and resource mobilization theory after that we did three types of social movements which were the redemptive reformist and revolutionary social movements after that we studied subaltern resistance and uh, the subaltern perspective that means the writing the history from below uh, we also studied about protests 
Then we went on to discuss about the comparison between old and new social movements. We moved on to the Indian context in order to see the typology of different movements in India. Then we also talked about the recent, the recent developments, especially in the light of study done by Gail Omved. After that, I tried to tell you about the blurring boundary between old and new social movement that it is no more possible to bifurcate the two because we get to see in a way the, the points of old social movement being there in the new social movements as well. And I gave you the example of three movements from Chipko to Koila Satyagraha and Niyamgiri Satyagraha in order to demonstrate how this, this boundary between the two is blurring. And after that, I told you about the recent developments in the field as in how there is this resistance and protest. These are two new categories. One is the resistance and two is the protest that you should remember. So now we have moved from the grand notion of social movements to these two micro notions of resistance and protest. So let me now quickly conclude because so we moved from pre-independence days to post-independence days. We have to remember the context of these two, the pre-independence and post-independence. Then we should remember about the range of issues from corruption, dowry, domestic violence, etc. to ideological orientation. So you should learn about the issues and ideological orientation. For example, in Sampoorn Kranti led by Sarvodaya leader JP, or say Nav Nirman movement in Gujarat, these movements had the blend of Gandhian and socialist ideology. So the point I wanted to make is that there can be different ways of looking at ideology. Similarly, in the Naxalite movement in the West Bengal and Chhattisgarh, there is this Maoist influence. So there is this Marxist kind of inclination. So there is a presence of different ideological inclinations in the social movements. And the last point that I have mentioned is that Gail Omved argues that we need to look for the connections between class, caste, gender and environment. So Omved argues that we cannot bifurcate these four because uh, the same movement may have the caste, class, gender and environment dimensions. So we should not look at them uh, being separate from each other but rather we need to take them together. So this was the point that I wanted to mention to conclude and uh, here I have given you some of the references which I have used and I would particularly like you to read three articles, one by Satish Deshpande, Contemporary India, A Sociological View, that is a book in which you will find some chapters. You should read this article by James Scott, Everyday Forms of Resistance and also this article, Social Movements in the volume on a contemporary, uh, this Oxford Indian Companion to Sociology. So if you will read a few articles on social movements, they will give you uh, an outline. So with that, I bring this uh, lecture to an end. I hope it was a learning session for you. Uh, so with that I end this. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people, Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare as he did Homer. 
but perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvellous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.